Happy New Year's everyone and welcome to the first WatchGuard Security Week in Review for the year 2014. If you're new to the show, this is a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing some practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security nerd, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting December 30th, 2013. Regular viewers probably noticed that I've been gone for the past two weeks, enjoying the Christmas and New Year's holiday. And despite the holidays, there's been a lot of information security news over the past few weeks. So rather than just summarizing this week's news, I'm going to summarize the news from the past three weeks. And let's start with probably the biggest noteworthy item, which is a big security breach affecting the U.S. retailer Target. Now, you've probably heard about the Target breach by now, and unlike many of the, the account breaches that have happened over the past few years, this is not a breach to Target's online website or any of their online entities. Rather, this is a breach that affected the point of sale of products or solutions that Target has in their physical stores. So apparently, this breach has affected 40 million customers that visited Target stores between the end of November and up to something like December 15th. So if you visited Target stores and you made a purchase on a credit card or a debit card, you may be affected by this breach. Now Target has not shared any technical details about the breach. You can probably guess it's not a SQL injection or not any typical network or website attack because this did not affect their online entity. This is something that affected their point of sale uh, products. And point of sale products are usually Windows or Linux computers running very specialized software that hook up to card scanners. Now it could be something like a network breach that installs uh, malware on the database or the point of sale products, or this could have just as likely been some sort of insider attack where some sort of uh, malicious insider stole a bunch of information. In either case, it's clear that the bad guys have made off with 40 million uh, uh, accounts or credit card accounts. They have the track two data, which is the magnetic stripe data on a credit card, and they even have the CVV number, the security code on the credit card, and Target has finally also admitted they might have your PIN number if you used your debit card. Now the good news for the PIN number is Target claims to use triple DES encryption on all PIN numbers, so hopefully the bad guys can actually crack the encryption for all the PINs. But this is a pretty big breach. So what should you do if you visited a Target store during this time? Well, according to the emails that all the customers are receiving that might be affected by this breach, you really ought to monitor your credit card purchases. Uh, at the current time, banks and credit card providers are not recommending customers go and get new credit cards, just that they monitor and look for illicit activity. Now, I'm sure this story is going to continue to develop over the months, so we'll sure to update you if there's any new news. In more breach news, Snapchat also had a big data leak. Grey Hat security group known as Gibson Security found a vulnerability in the way Snapchat finds friends. And while they warned Snapchat of the vulnerability, Snapchat didn't really respond. So just this week, Gibson Security leaked a database of 4.6 million uh, Snapchat accounts, which include uh, a, a censored phone number for the Snapchat user as well as a Snapchat user name. Now, Snapchat has since kind of fixed this vulnerability. They've throttled the Find Friends capability, so it's harder for bad guys to collect 4.6 million records. Uh, but this is a kind of interesting story in that the security group that found the vulnerability tried to let Snapchat know about it, but apparently Snapchat didn't respond to their email for over four months and kind of left this open. Now, the good news is there's no credential information. Uh, there's no addresses. Your real name isn't leaked, but if you use Snapchat, there is a chance that your phone number could get out there. And while your phone number isn't the most sensitive piece of information you have, it is a sensitive piece of information. Attackers can use it for a lot of things, including phone spam and social engineering, but often phone numbers are used as a token of authentication for other sites as well. So this is a pretty interesting breach. If you're a Snapchat user, you can go to the Gibson security site and see the Snapchat database to see if you're one of the affected users. 
does affect the majority of Snapchat users. There's not much you can do about it. So far, Gibson hasn't only released censored phone numbers, meaning they hide the last two digits, but it's fairly easy for bad guys to get around that. So we'll let you know if this story changes in the future. Moving on to hacktivist news, the Syrian Electronic Army is at it again. Over the past week, they were able to hijack many of the social network sites associated with Skype and Microsoft. Specifically, they gained access to the Skype Twitter account and blog page, and were able to post some pretty, you know, joking and malicious posts on Twitter, talking about how Microsoft is stealing everyone's Skype information. Uh, now, this attack was probably just some sort of bad password, and the fact that they were able to hijack many different social network sites shows that uh, the Skype people may have been using the same password in many different places. So to learn from this problem, you really should consider password best practices. By now, you've probably heard me say them many times. Use long passwords. They should be over 12 to 14 characters. My recommendation is use a passphrase, a full sentence with proper punctuation situation since it's easy to remember and very long so it's hard to crack. On top of that you definitely have to use different passwords at every different site you visit. If you can I really suggest you use something called a password vault. Password vaults make it easy to use many different random long passwords and not have to worry too much about remembering them because the password vault will take care of it for you. If these Skype folks hadn't used the same password everywhere these hacktivists probably wouldn't have been able to hijack all their social network accounts. Some quick news for the OpenSSL users out there. During the week, the OpenSSL webpage was defaced and hijacked. Now, if you're an OpenSSL user like me, you might be immediately concerned that maybe the source repository was, was hijacked and backdoored as well. Now, the good news is that's not the case. It turns out OpenSSL hosts their website via some hosting company, an ISP. And this ISP probably used a bad password on their virtual hypervisor they used to host host all the different websites uh, on their hosting site. So this was simply a matter of a poor password that bad guys were able to figure out or brute force or whatever. Uh, since this attack, OpenSSL has fixed their website and again it doesn't affect the OpenSSL software at all. So the final story for this week is news of some more backdoors and very popular consumer DSL routers. During the week a security researcher disclosed information about a backdoor he found that affected for sure certain Netgear and Linksys DSL routers, specifically ones that used a SIRCOM chip. Now, I won't go into all the technical detail on how he found the backdoor. Essentially, he found a service listening on port, TCP port 32764. And when he played with that service, he found that it was a very proprietary service that was pretty easy to reverse engineer, and he could use it to gain root access to his DSL router. Now, the good news is uh, this only worked from the internal networks, from the trusted or Wi-Fi network on the device. It did not work from the external network or the DSL portion of these Netgear and Linksys devices. However, the researcher also mentioned that he suspects maybe other devices that use SIRCOM chips are affected. And some publications have pointed out that older WatchGuard devices have used SIRCOM chips in the past. Now, if you're wondering if we're vulnerable, we're pretty sure we're not. We don't use the same DSL controller as these devices. We have our own custom firmware running on these devices, and we don't run any service on, on port 32764 and as a firewall, we close all unnecessary services too. So we are double checking right now internally, running Nmap on some of these older devices, but this does not affect WatchGuard devices the way some people have alluded that it might. In any case, if you do use certain Netgear and uh, Linksys routers, you might want to check out the research. I'll post a link to it on the blog to see if you're affected. I suspect that the vendors will eventually release some firmware to fix this. So that's it for my first week back. As always, there's a lot of other security stories I didn't cover, especially considering I've been gone for a few weeks. You might want to check out the WatchGuard Security Center blog, and specifically the video post I put associated with this video will have a lot of references to some of the stories I couldn't share. And on top of that, we share a lot of security news on the WatchGuard Security Center blog as well. That, and you can also follow me on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech.
As always, thank you very much for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.